Hi there, Smart Drivers, talking to you tonight about situational awareness. Where am I, what's going on around me, and what's coming at me down the road? Stick around, we'll be right back with that information. Hi there, Smart Drivers, welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test, talking to you tonight about situational awareness to keep yourself safe, to be a smarter driver, and know what's going on around you and significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. And this is one of the experiential things that you need to be a safer, smarter driver. It's also one of the things that you need as a skill, a fundamental skill, to be able to pass your driver's test, regardless of what class of license you're going for, where you are in the world. This is one of the fundamental skills that you will keep building and advancing as your driving more and more on different types of roadways in different communities, different cities, those types of things. So it's important to ask yourself the question when you're driving, where am I? Am I on a residential road? Am I on a freeway, on an interstate? Am I in a, at a complex intersection in a busy city uh, at rush hour in the morning? All of these factors are going to determine what you do, how you do it, and there are some fundamentals that you're going to put in place that are going to keep you safe when you're driving. So, Richie's here, Mallory is here. Hello, Mallory. Uh, now that I just saw your name pop up on the live stream, my con sincere condolences about your grandmother passing. Uh, I did get your email, didn't get back to you. I do apologize about that. It's been a very busy week. Uh, Evan is here and Lady Death is here. Question about an older vehicle and how to get that going. We can uh, talk about that during the discussion period. Bluffer is here. Good evening. Uh, you've been thinking up some questions to ask. Awesome. Abigail is here as well. And so if you're just tuning into the live stream here, uh, let me know where you're tuning in from, which part of North America, what we can help you with, uh, what stage of the learner's license you're at. Are you in the learner's phase? Are you preparing for your driver's tests in a few weeks? Are you going to be taking your driver's test in the winter time? I put a video up one of the shorts, one of the video shorts up over on TikTok and it got a lot of traffic about taking your driver's test in the winter time. And as I've been telling you, uh, all of the smart drivers that it's easier to pass your driver's test in the winter time because it's not as exact. Now, obviously there are other skills that you need to have in place when you're driving. You need to manage space well, you need to understand forward stability, our stability control rather you know steering what the vehicle is doing on the roadway slippery conditions better control of the primary controls the steering wheel the brake the throttle those types of things so this is all of the things that you're doing in the winter time so yes the driving test is a bit easier but i think it's easier because when you're learning to drive in the winter time you're learning at an advanced level not like in the summertime tino's here jay's here from ottawa ontario as it in, uh, I don't think I said that right, is tuning in from Atlanta, Georgia. My friend Tim is here from Drive Smart BC. If you're living in the province of British Columbia, have any questions about case law, traffic safety, policing, definitely check out uh, Tim's website, Drive Smart BC. Excellent resource, great blogs over there as well. He has a forum that you can participate in and talk to other leading authorities in the field. Talk to Tim and get resources and get directed to other experts. So definitely check that out if you're in the province of British Columbia. And I have a question for Tim. Highway 97 between Vernon and Winfield here, it's uh, probably a 20 mile stretch of road. It is incredibly dark at night and I know that they used to put glass in the paint that they put the lines on the road with. There's no glass in the paint anymore because <clears throat> of environmental factors that we have to have paint that's water-based now which of course doesn't work on roadways and whatnot and <clears throat> there are absolutely no reflectors that work anyway on top of the concrete barriers that go down the center of the roadway what can we do who can we contact to improve at least the reflectors on the roadway because i've been on interstates in the u.s that when you go down the road at night the reflectors are so good that the roadway is lit up like a runway, an airport runway. So who do we talk to about that? Let's let me know, Tim. Okay. Uh, Wendy's here. Purchased my permit appointment. One scheduled for uh, February 16th and another for the 17th, uh, both for just the knowledge test. But uh, Wendy, you're going to pass on the first go there. So know that. And when you're 
studying for your learner's test, don't read the driver's manual cover to cover, okay? You're not gonna get the information you need. Go to the practice driving test questions on the websites. There's lots of them here on the internet. Just go into Google, search driving practice test questions. Uh, here in the province of British Columbia, we have the Richmond Public Library. They have an excellent pool of practice driving test questions. And then go back to the driving handbook and look up the sections that you're not getting the questions right in that way. Uh, that will be much more efficient in terms of studying for your learner's test. Know that it's computer-based and as well know that all of the questions are multiple choice and be able to identify key words in the question, keywords in the, the answers, uh, the possible solutions as well and that all of that will help you to pass your uh, learner's test first time. Uh, Wendy, thank you for your advice. I've listed the numbers of the air brake system. It helped. Awesome. That's great. Uh, Tim says it's a durability problem. TransBC on Twitter is a good place to start. Okay. And Tim, I absolutely agree with you in terms of durability. Uh, this is the issue that I have in terms of environmental, you know, environmental. Okay. We need to have paints that aren't petrol based. We now have paints that are water based. And so we put them on the roadway and it's exactly what you said. They're not durable. So now we're painting lines on roadways every year. We're using increased resources. We're uh, putting fuel in trucks. We're paying workers to paint the lines on the roads every year instead of every two years. So where is the environmental trade-off? There's no environmental trade-off because we're spending more to put the lines on the road, more diesel fuel being burned in these trucks and those types of things to paint the lines on the roadway. Whereas if we just use petrol base, we wouldn't be using as many resources and paints and those types of things to put them down on the roadway. So <laughs> I don't think the environmentalism is working. Uh, Raza, you're most welcome. Uh, Wendy, I've been reading the air brake section over and over again. Okay, and uh, make sure that you know what the tests are, Wendy. Uh, the five tests you have to do in the cab. Governor tests, uh, low air warning, uh, pump down, so the parking emergency brake supply at between 20 and 45. The compressor test and then maximum pressure, which is the governor cutout, and then you have to do your leak test, uh, which is one minute. Uh, can't lose more than three pounds for a tractor trailer unit, four pounds. No, three pounds for single unit, four pounds for tractor trailer, and six pounds for tractor and two trailers. Okay. Uh, uh, Tim says uh, embedded reflectors are a good alternative, and yes, I have to agree with that. Now, uh, embedded reflectors, Tim, are those a something that can be retrofitted or do they have to be put down when the road surface is being put down? I know we have kind of another conversation going on here. Uh, Norrell, I just want to know how to have control of the car when it's snowing and the roads are full of slush. Uh, go slow, stay in the grooves where the vehicle is traveling and that way you're going to stay out of the piles of snow and those types of things. Of course, some places you're going to have to go slower than others, but most important, of course, have good tires on your vehicle. That's going to make all of the difference uh, in the winter time. All right, uh, Bluffer, when do you, when you do the end test here in British Columbia, will I be tested on hand signals? If so, do you have any videos on those? Yes, we Bluffer, you may be tested on those. It's up to the discretion of the examiner. And yes, we do have a video. Corey will put that up for you. Uh, Corey is here. I forgot to introduce Corey. My apologies. Uh, Bricks for Wheels. Corey is the moderator does an excellent job of getting up videos that I suggest you have a look at for more in-depth answers uh, that I give. And uh, he also keeps out the bad people. <laughs> so that's Corey. Thank you so much, Corey. Uh, and Tim says retrofit is definitely possible with the reflectors. And the other piece about the reflectors, and of course they can be retrofitted, the thing that bothers me is not the road markings with the, the, the paint used to have the glass in them. And I think I'm correct on that. Am I not, Tim? Uh, the reflectors on the top of the concrete barriers, there's none of those. Like they're there, but they're not reflecting the light out. And maybe it's because it's dirty. It's just that kind of time of year. But they need it needs to be improved because the roadway is dangerous at night. It's like I'm navigating down the roadway by looking for traffic signs along the roadway and I'm looking to following other traffic. I can't actually see the roadway in front of my vehicle. Uh, it's pretty dangerous. Uh, Squirrely, what is your favorite province to drive in freely in? Uh, Squirrely, my 
province or state that I like to drive in is any state that doesn't have speed cameras. <laughs> I have a real problem with speed cameras. Uh, okay. Uh, Mallory, thank you for your condolences. We had rain and freezing rain here in Nova Scotia the past few days. The kind of weather that is really, really yucky to drive in in the winter time. All right, so we're going to get over to the PowerPoint presentation. The way that it works here is I'll do a <clears throat> excuse me, presentation for about 10, 11 minutes. And then after the presentation, I'll come back and we'll spend the remainder of the hour answering any questions you have about driving, getting your driving, passing your driver's test, your learners, being a safer, smarter driver, or starting your career as a bus or truck driver. So we'll help you with all of that. So, and if it's busy, so if I don't get to your question right away, uh, just cut and paste it and put it back in the comment section there and then just put an arrow and remind me and I'll get back to your question, okay? So we're gonna get over to situational awareness here and you can see uh, in the slide, it's very different if you're on a rural two-lane highway with possible goats crossing the roadway or other kinds of animals, horses, cows, those types of things or deer whatever elk we get that kind of stuff out here in british columbia as opposed to being at a complex intersection in a large metropolitan area with traffic cabs cyclists pedestrians every form of traffic that you can imagine and complex intersections with slip lanes turning lanes advanced greens and all of those types of things so these are the different types of situational awareness that i'm talking about and the contrast or disparity between those types, those different types of traffic situations. For those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I drove truck for through the most of the 1990s, delivering freight between Canada and the United States. And while I went to university in Australia in the early 2000s, I drove buses for Greyhound there in Australia between Melbourne, Australia, Sydney, Australia, Canberra, and Parks, New South Wales. Became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997. I have done some driver rehabilitation, working with people who'd had strokes or brain injuries or those types of things, and then returning to driving. Uh, 2006, I graduated from the University of Melbourne with my doctorate in legal history, which is the study of policing, courts, and prisons. And my expertise is in policing as it relates to or policing as it relates to traffic. Oddly enough, 2015, I started the YouTube channel and the online business. And it's been wildly more successful than I could have ever imagined in helping all kinds of drivers to become safer, smarter drivers, not just to earn a driver's license, but empowering them to become safer, smarter drivers. And if you want to know more about me, you can check out the autobiography, my autobiography over at the Smart Drive Test website. A uh, new video this week, I started working with Chloe and her little Volkswagen Beetle. And uh, she's getting ready for her driver's test uh, mid-February here. And uh, she's doing well. We're just working on shoulder checking and all the other skills and techniques, of course, that you need to be successful in passing your driver's test first time. So definitely check out her video as well. I edited the video a little bit differently than I normally do. So it's not really kind of a linear start to, to end kind of video. I've just more or less given you some tips and techniques for being successful in your driver's test. So definitely have a look at that. And if you have any suggestions or feedback, always welcome because it always improves the videos and my ability to deliver information for you to you all right so we're going to talk about situational awareness one of the examples i want to use is kind of barbecuing and swimming we tend to think that neither you know both of these activities are innocuous which means they're not going to harm us but here in the in canada we have 50 to 60 people a year that die in swimming accidents and we probably have 10 times that in the United States of America in the number of people who die. Barbecuing, we often think that there <laughs> isn't a lot of, you know, issues that could come up around barbecuing, but the number of house fires that happen because, uh, you know, people don't clean out their barbecues and there's all that grease in the bottom and the, and the barbecue catches on fire and they have to bring in the fire department to put out the fire and those types of things. So there are things that can hurt us, but oftentimes we're not thinking in terms of, oh, danger, danger. And as well, you know, in the kitchen, kitchen cupboards, for example, if you leave the top cupboard open and you kneel down underneath the cupboard to get something and you stand up and you get the corner of the door and the top of your head, which from experience, let me tell you, really, really hurts. 
The reason I'm using these two examples is because it's like driving. Most people get in their car and they feel completely safe. They feel that they're not going to be in a crash. And as well, traffic safety statistics support that notion of drivers feeling safe in their cars, that it is a personal space that is safe because we know that traffic crashes only happen once every 15 or 16 years per vehicle. They don't happen very often. And when they do happen, they're few and far between and they are only there for a very short period of time. So what are the priorities when you're driving? What do we need to pay attention to? How do we manage space effectively around our vehicles? Because my professional thinking is that crashes happen because drivers mismanage speed, speed and space. They're unwilling to give the right of way and they're traveling too fast and too close to other objects on the roadway. So as a driver, as somebody who's trying to be defensive, somebody who's trying to be smarter, ask yourself the question, what is the traffic that is on the roadway? Do you have a big semi truck beside you? Do you have an SUV? Do you have a sports car? Do you have a motorcycle, somebody on a bicycle? Those types of things. And what kind of a road are you on? Are you on a skinny two lane or are you on a wide multi-lane uh, interstate that's a ring road around, you know, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, for example, and there's six lanes going in each direction. Uh, do you, what kind of calm awareness do you have that you're monitoring the situation and you're on and you're thinking about your driving all the time? Or have you simply gone into that state where you're not really paying attention at all? Because we do make mistakes when we're driving and do you have habits and techniques in place that are going to keep you safe? So, Assessment for learning, you have to assess your own abilities as a driver, but as a driving instructor, you need to assess your student's ability and your student's ability to take on information and incorporate that information in their driving. All right, so do you have a nervous Nelly, confident Carl? What kind of a learner are you? Uh, so how much can you take on? How much can you incorporate? Can you take on more information? What kind of a learner are you? This is another question you need to ask yourself when you're learning how to drive, you're preparing for a driver's test. Are you an audible learner? Can you hear something and then just do it? Can you see something and then just do it? You need to see a video or you need to see the instructor draw a picture of those types of things. Or do you need to see it and do it and have it demonstrated for you? So think about all of those questions. Okay, scope three. This is the defensive driving model that I've been working on. This is the second edition of it. It used to be called Spock, but now it's called Scope. Uh, social driving, space management, speed management, communication and observation. And communication is there twice, which is a mistake on my part. I apologize. All right. So social driving is the problem. Space and speed management, communication and observation are the tools that you put in place to keep yourself safe. Know that when you're preparing for a driver's test, for example, that everybody else is going to be driving the traffic flow, which is going to be 10 to 15 miles an hour over the posted speed limit. You preparing for a driver's test in preparation for taking your test must drive the posted speed limit. And that is one of the difficulties for new drivers. Okay, yellow alert, calm awareness, as I was saying before. Where are your intersections? 40% of crashes happen at intersections. You need to map intersections. What kind of an intersection is it? Does it have turning lanes? Does it have advanced greens? You need to track other road users as you're sitting waiting at the traffic light. Are they crossing your path of travel when you're going to move through the intersection, whether you're taking a right turn or you're taking a left turn or moving through the intersection straight through? Are you alert to the changes that are happening because traffic is always changing. It's always, always dynamic. So where am I? Are you sitting in traffic? Are you driving on a highway? Are you passing other vehicles? What kinds of vehicles are around you? As I said previously in the introduction, are they big trucks? Are they uh, cargo vans, white delivery vans? Uh, <laughs> Tim says, me first is a common problem that we need to overcome. And that is the very basis of social driving. We follow too close. We speed. We fail to give the right of way. These are all hallmarks of social driving. This is the problem. This is the challenge that you face every time you get in your vehicle, every time you drive, and exactly what Tim says. Not only is it me first, but we have a culture based on loose driving rules, and those loose driving rules also 
make it okay for us to be reactionary and retaliatory in our driving. If we drive too slow, somebody tailgates us telling us that we're driving too slow. Or if somebody is tailgating us in terms of being retaliatory in the arena of social driving, we'll slow down 10 kilometers an hour or 10 miles an hour just to upset the person behind us to tell them that they're doing something wrong. So we need to move away from this idea of me first. We need to move away from this idea of driving be re being retaliatory, that we're getting back at the other person, or reactionary, that we're following too close and hoping on a wing and a prayer, that if the person in front of us does something goofy, can we get our vehicle stopped and whatnot. So think of all of that when you're driving. Determine gap, you're turning left at, left at uh, intersection, complex intersections. Lots of new drivers will talk about being honked at by other drivers on the roadway because of course it's me first and they're impatient and they're honking and hurt, getting you to hurry up and get going. What you need to do is you need to focus on what you're doing. If you're not comfortable going, if you don't have enough experience with gap and those types of things, focus on what you're doing, not what other drivers are doing or what other drivers think you should be doing. So ebb and flow of driving lessons, what is expected of you, situational awareness and teaching moments. And of course, this is one of the most challenging environments in the wintertime when you got a skiff of snow and the temperature is around freezing, 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. And don't let anybody else tell you something different. I had some comment from somebody on the channel and they're like, oh, it's more slippery at this temperature. And I'm like, no, it's most slippery when the temperature is around freezing. So know that. Uh, as a driving instructor, as a new driver, as somebody who's learning how to drive a truck or a bus. Okay, what is the purpose of your learning to drive? Are you a first licensed driver? Are you getting a CDL license? Are you a driving instructor? What is the purpose of getting your license and driving? And where are you going to be driving? Are you driving from home to work, home to school? What are the roads like? When, at what time are you going to be driving? as Tim and I were talking about here at the beginning of the live stream in terms of Highway 97 between Vernon, British Columbia and Winfield, the road is dark. And it's even harder to, to navigate the road at night when the traffic on the other side of the concrete barrier is has its lights in your face because it just glares everything and then it just makes it almost nigh impossible to see the highway, which is just, it's, it's <laughs> one of the, Hardest driving experiences I've ever been in. And I've been in a lot of dark roads on in my lifetime. So uh, definitely interesting and definitely going to write a letter uh, and talk about that to the authorities and see if we can get something done about that on this highway to make it safer. Okay, experiential. Uh, I did put a poll up on the YouTube channel here a little while back and asked people what why they thought that young drivers are at a higher risk of being involved in a crash. Uh, almost 60% of drivers said that it's inexperience. And of course, I would add to that that it's not only inexperience, it's also the fact that new drivers, young drivers are facing many of the you know, new things in their life all at the same time. They're drinking, driving, dating, and distractions, especially now with cell phones and tele telematics in the vehicles with the big screen with the stereo and the you know access to social media and your satellite radio and all of those types of things i get in new cars uh and i i see that big screen in the middle of the car and i just think how how do auto manufacturers think this is safe uh it's crazy and it's, it's the same thing with my vehicle the buggy i just put a new stereo in it and it's got these glowing blue lights on it at night which are completely distracting and of course draw your vision into that light and makes me tired when i'm driving at night it doesn't also help when i can't see the highway and those types of things so crazy all right so good luck in your driver's test and remember pick the best answer not necessarily the right answer and we'll transition back over here and we'll answer any questions okay uh Rena, I already got a speeding ticket. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. Uh, hopefully it wasn't too damaging. Uh, Corey's put, put up the video about managing space around your vehicle. Thanks for that. Uh, Jimmy, I uh, love the topic, 30 years of driving for the New York City Transit. And Jimmy, I'm sure that has been very interesting job and 30 years of driving in New York City and driving for transit there. I'm sure you've seen uh, some interesting things and had some inter interesting experiences driving for sure. 
Uh, Tyler, I had someone give me the middle finger because I wasn't speeding. <laughs> yeah, Tyler, that's that's definitely going to happen. Uh, Evan, when doing a three-point turn after pulling over to the right, do, don't signal left to go to the other side of the road as other cars think you're going to go further on the road, rather position left. Uh, Evan, that's not true. You are going to move the vehicle left across the roadway. You have to signal left, okay, especially for a driver's test. You have to signal right to move over to the right shoulder of the road, and then you're gonna shoulder check, you're gonna mirror signal shoulder check to the left, you're gonna go across the road, and then you're gonna signal to the right again because you're gonna move the back of the vehicle to the right, and then you're gonna signal left again when you pull out to go in the other direction. So those of you who don't know what a three-point turn is, K-turn, Y-turn, all the same thing. It's how you turn the vehicle around 180 degrees by doing three points. So it's over to the shoulder of the road, one point, two points, and then three points to carry in the other direction. That's a three-point turn. And Corey, I'll put the video up for you for more details on that and how you have to do that for the purposes of a driver's test. If you're in the state of Kentucky, there is a little bit of confusion, not a lot. Two-point reverse turn. Sometimes called a three-point turn in the state of Kentucky, it's not a three-point turn. It's a two-point reverse turn, which means is that you drive past the laneway and then you back around the corner into the laneway or cross street. Uh, that's what you're doing in the state of Kentucky. Uh, Sheldon, I wanna know if someone moved to another state like Baltimore and if the person wants to change their address on their learner's permit or driver's license or do they have to start over? Uh, my understanding, Sheldon, is, is that you don't have to start over. You simply just have to change your license over to that state. I believe that most states in the U.S. have a trans... You can transfer your license from one state to another without having to retest. Check the GDL requirements in that state, in that driver's handbook. So if you're moving... Uh, you didn't say where you're moving to, but if you're, say for example, you're moving from Maryland to West Virginia, just go to the West Virginia driver's handbook and look up what the requirements are for the GDL and the learner's permit. Uh, you may have to wait longer. So it might be, instead of 180 days, it might be a whole year that you have to wait on your learners, but definitely look up that there and that'll help you out. Uh, <laughs> Carl, the joys of driving a garbage truck in the Ottawa convoy. Yeah, I'm sure that's interesting. Uh, uh, Raza, which one's the better to drive on? Uh, my personal experience in terms of driving on ice and snow is always a manual transmission. Uh, automatics are going to do you just as well. Uh, it depends on sort of traction control and how good your vehicle is. I mean, if you've got a an Audi with Quattro uh, traction control in it, I mean, you know, that's going to be one of the best you can get. So for sure. Uh, uh, Tim says you should not be scheduling a test if you're not ready and I would agree with what Tim has said and if you have a driving instructor that's saying to you hey you're probably not ready you probably need a couple of more lessons I would be listening to the advice of your driving instructor because remember driving instructors those of us that are driving instructors we teach people how to pass a driver's test every day that's what we do we know whether you have the skills abilities and techniques in place that are going to allow you to be successful on your driver's test. So I always say this to smart drivers, if you're not taking driver training, book a lesson with a driving instructor because I can sit here, myself, Tim, uh, Goose, uh, my friend Sam in New York City, we can give you general information about driving we can tell you about driving test centers that we have been at. For me, for example, London, Ontario, Canada, uh, Victoria, British Columbia, here in Vernon and Kelowna. I can tell you about those driving test centers and in Kamloops, I tested there as well. But your specific DMV is going to have particular details that I'm not going to be able to give you information about. A driving instructor who works in your area is going to be able to give you that, in, that specific information. Uh, so you need to know that and have a look at the video. Corey, I'll put that up for you on my failed driver's test in the state of New York because the speed limit is 25 and driving 25, km, or 25 miles an hour for me is very weird. So that's the one thing. And also you can't turn right on a red light in the New York City in the five boroughs. 
So Manhattan, Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens, and Staten Island, you cannot turn right on a red light there. And I turned right on a red light and of course was unsuccessful on my driver's test. Now, there's also some details in and around the test center where Sam took me and there was one intersection where the stop line was way back from the, from the intersection. And unless you took a driving lesson with an instructor, you wouldn't know that, okay? Uh, Jim, how many times can you fail the driving test in Georgia? Uh, Jim, I don't think there's a number of times that you can fail the driver's test. Hopefully you're not gonna fail the driver's test more than three or four times before you're successful. But uh, there's probably a waiting period. I know that they've implemented a waiting period here in the province of British Columbia and other places where if you fail your driver's test, initially you have to wait two weeks and then you have to wait a month and then you have to wait two months, you know, so forth and so on. <laughs> so, uh, Reggie, what's a good way to control the throttle so that you don't have a heavy foot? A uh, good way to do that, Reggie, is to put your heel on the floor, curl your toes, and push the throttle with just your toes. Okay, that'll work as well. Have a look at the video. Uh, Corey will put that up for you on speed control, and that will help you to work the throttle better and have better mastery of speed uh, in your vehicle. Uh, A-Pink, uh, which is worse, not signaling at all when changing lanes versus signaling at the very last minute when changing lanes or using the wrong turn signal. Uh, both are just equally as bad. Uh, remember what I say to students all the time. Signals are to tell others that you wish to move over, not in fact that you are moving over, okay? And I know that in some places, if you're in New York City or you're in Philadelphia or in your Los Angeles or you're in Dallas, any one of these big metropolitan cities, Montreal, uh, Canada, Toronto, Canada, Vancouver, you're gonna have to be a bit pushy. You put on three signals, three flashes on the signal minimum, and then you start moving over, you start crowding the left side of your lane, and that will cause other drivers to get kind of nervous because remember, leave your signal on <laughs> because you got this signal going and you're gonna move over and you need, you're crowding that left side of the lane. You're not out of your lane, but you're crowding the left side. Drivers behind you are gonna be thinking, okay, that person is eventually gonna come over. They're eventually gonna get frustrated and they're just gonna bulldoze out onto the roadway. So that's how you open up a gap and get other drivers to kind of help you out to merge and change lanes uh, when you're driving. Uh, Mallory, back in December, one of the intersections was changed from a two-way intersection to a four-way intersection here in town. Uh, yeah, Mallory, and they'll, they'll do that. Uh, we had similar thing happen here in Vernon where they changed a two-way to a four-way just kind of outside of one of the school zones. So that was interesting as well. Uh, Big Mac Sam, I had a student that told me he failed the road test 11 times in a 10 year span. He was taking the test every year. <laughs> and I've had students here on the, on the channel on Smart Drive Test who have told me they failed the driver's test eight or nine times. I, you know, interesting. And I uh, actually, I had a student and I don't know whether there was truth in this, but there was a smart driver here on the channel that was telling me that he was in his 40s and he had taken the driver's test one or two times every year since he was eligible to take his driver's license and was still unable to pass his driver's test in the city of New York. So if I see him again, maybe what I'll do uh, is send him to you, Sam, and maybe that would be a good challenge for you, see if we can get him to pass his driver's test. Uh, Wendy, uh, engine braking is just the natural slowing of the vehicle with no acceleration, correct? Uh, yes, Wendy, that is correct. Uh, so you just take your foot off the fuel pedal and the engine will slow down the vehicle. Now that doesn't work very well uh, in modern trucks because of all of the technology of you know better bearings, better tires, all of those types of things. So most vehicles are going to be fitted with an engine brake, which basically shuts off the exhaust valves on the engine and creates back pressure in the engine so that it will help to slow down. <clears throat> Uh, Tyler, I was watching people driving in India. It's scary how they overtake on a blind corner and risk and risking their life. Uh, Tyler, yes, they have a very different sense of driving, not only in India, but as well China and other developing countries in the world. Can we still use that word? Is that is that PC? Or well, I know we can't use third world, so I don't know what the PC term is, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so... I was on a bus going to the Great Wall of China and uh, the bus had slowed down going up a hill and there was a car 
a luxury car that went past on the shoulder probably doing 60 or 70 miles an hour. So this is kind of the way that they drive uh, in these other countries where road rules are really not in place and they don't really have the policing and those types of things. Uh, Crystal, hello my friend. Rena, your videos are helpful. If even through I have my driver's license, I'm still learning different things. Uh, it's that normal, my driver's license is one year already. Uh, Rena, that's awesome. Thank you for being a smart driver and continuing to be here on the Smart Drive Test channel. And uh, so happy to hear that we can help out and continue to help you improve. For sure, that's great. Uh, Eric, you just got your license. Congratulations on passing your driver's test. That is awesome, my friend. Uh, so Corey's put up the video on how to control the fuel pedal, how to learn to have better throttle control in the vehicle. That's awesome. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Wendy, are the spring brakes... Uh, and the spring brakes is just a part of the emergency brake system. Correct. I just want to be clear in that definition. Okay, so Wendy, spring brakes, it's, it's a goofy term. The springs are the power source that applies the parking brakes on the big truck. So what happens is when you push the button in on the on the dash, the valve, the yellow parking brake button, the four-sided yellow parking brake button, you put air into the spring brake chamber. So there's a big 2,500 pound spring in that chamber. And so what happens is, is that when the vehicle is parked, you've exhausted all of the air out of the air brake system. There's no air in the system. So you get in the vehicle, you start it up, you start pumping up air in the system. Once it gets up to above 90 pounds, you put air into the system and it will go into the spring brake chambers and it will compress those springs. Okay, so now the parking brakes are off, you go up and down the road and now you use air pressure to apply the, the brake pedal. Okay, you come up to a stoplight, you push down on the brake pedal, that spring remains caged or compressed by the air pressure and now there's the service brake chamber so there's two chambers the spring brake chamber and the service brake chamber the service brake chamber works the brakes as you're going up and down the road you come back at the end of the day you park the truck you pull that button out on the dash the four-sided parking brake button and you exhaust all of the air on the button now the spring expands and it applies the brakes so that's the parking brake and it's called a spring brake which is dumb it's a dumb term the other piece is that the spring brake also works as the emergency brake. So if you're going down the road and all of a sudden you have a catastrophic air, lo air loss and all the air bleeds out of the system, which it's not going to because there's too many fail safes in the system, then that spring again will expand because there's no air pressure to hold it closed. It will expand and apply the brakes for you. That's what the spring brakes are. They're the power source for the parking emergency brakes. It's, think of it as the parking brake in your car. It's exactly the same idea, except in your car, it's manual. You have to apply it. In a big truck, it's automatic with air pressure and that big spring, okay? Draymond, uh, I had some nut job flashes. Johnson at me <laughs> out of road rage, serious story. Uh, Green, yeah, I. <laughs> people are weird, <laughs> especially when they drive. <laughs> They do all kinds of weird things. Uh, Ruben, is it okay to stop and wait if there's a ton of traffic? Are you talking? No. <laughs> Corey, put the video up on merging. <laughs> the one with the horse. The one with the dead horse. Uh, no. No, you really can't. Uh, you got to get out there. You got to match the speed, the flow of traffic on the highway. And you need to put that signal on and you need to get over because you will be able to get over. Uh, John, what does it mean if the traffic is blinking red or yellow? Okay, so if the light is blinking red, that means that you must come to a complete stop. Uh, Bluffer, I'm not ignoring you. It's busy. Lots going on here. I'll get to your question, okay? Uh, so if it's flashing red, that means that you must come to a complete stop. A flashing red light usually accompanies a stop sign at an intersection. And if there's a flashing red light, it's telling you that it is a high risk intersection. There have been a lot of crashes at that intersection. So know that with a flashing red light. And actually I'll do a video on this for you for flashing yellow lights and flashing red lights. We have one outside of town here where there's been, there's a memorial out there actually. And I was just doing some research for the book on this memorial that's out there. 
And that's one of the things that they did to improve the intersection was they put up a flashing red light and it accompanies the stop sign. And that tells you that if they have that in place as well, they have rumble strips as you're approaching the stop sign to indicate to you that it's a high risk intersection. You're coming off a side street onto the highway, which is where they're doing, you know, they're doing 65, 70, sometimes even 80 miles an hour on that road. Okay, so know that. A flashing yellow light means that it is used with caution. Scan the intersection, map road users, track them, make sure that they're not crossing your path of travel as you're proceeding down the highway and that will keep you safe, okay? PJ, I passed my road test watching your videos. That's awesome, congratulations PJ. So happy that, to help hear that we could help out. That's great. Uh, Bluffer, you asked me a question. Would really appreciate the answer to my question. Bluffer, 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 where's your question? I have a really bad habit of not having two hands on the wheel at all times. Any suggestions? Uh, this would be an auto fail if the examiner sees one hand on the wheel. Uh, no, Bluffer, it's not an automatic fail unless you do it for a long period of time. But remember, for the purposes of the driver's test, it's only 20 minutes, okay? Depending on where you're taking your driver's test. If it's in New York City, it could be as short as eight minutes. <clears throat> Excuse me. You only have to keep your hands on the wheel for a very short period of time for the duration of the driver's test, okay? And just remember, when you go in, two hands on the, driver, on the, the wheel, and just when you're practicing, do the same thing. Say to yourself, okay, 10 minutes, I'm going to keep my hands on the steering wheel for the purposes of 10 minutes, okay? Do that, practice that, and then when you come to your driving test, you'll be ready, okay, with two hands on the steering wheel. And as well, if that doesn't work, get somebody to go with you. <laughs> Just get them to repeat to you ad nauseum. Two hands on the wheel, driver. Two hands on the wheel, driver. And, you know, I've worked with CDL drivers all the time. Same thing. And I tell them all the time. Two hands on the wheel, driver. Two hands on the wheel. It's one of the things you repeat over and over and over again. So that's what you need to do to get two hands on the steering wheel for the purposes of being successful on your driver's test. Uh... So it wasn't ignoring you, Bluffer. Just lots going on. Uh, Wendy, thank you, Mr. August. I feel like I have the gist of it, the gist of it, but that's not good enough for me to feel like I can pass. About 70% confident that I'll pass. Okay. Uh, Wendy, send me an email. I've got some practice driving uh, test questions for the air brakes over at the uh, Smart Drive Test website as well. I'll make sure that you have the handout for the questions in the cab. And I know that the Richmond Public Library has... Air uh, excuse me, air brake questions as well. So we can get you in touch with all of those resources and those will help you to pass your driver's test as well. I have practice driving test questions depending on what state or province you're in uh, that will help you to pass and uh, they're only about 10 bucks, okay? And completely guaranteed that you'll pass first time. Uh, just keep those hands glued to the wheel. Yes, uh, Ruben, what's the difference of driving at night, aside from obvious that you feel the vision is reduced and why is it a requirement? Uh, Ruben, driving at night, your vision is reduced by half. And we were talking about this at the beginning of the live stream about how difficult it is to drive on this stretch of highway here between Vernon, British Columbia and Winfield because all of the reflectors, none of the reflectors are working. They're either covered over with dirt or as Tim mentioned, my friend at Smart Drive BC, that, or Drive Smart BC rather, that uh, durability, the paint used to be reflective. It used to have glass in it. Uh, all of the reflectors are now cheap plastic. They're not quality plastic that's going to be reflective for, you know, any, any amount of time. And I've been on roadways in the United States where the reflectors have allowed the roadway to be lit up at night like a airport runway uh this <laughs> like as i said when i'm navigating a highway at night by following other traffic and looking for traffic signs along the roadway it, it, that th that should be in terms of the things that you're looking for when you're navigating a roadway at night that should be kind of down the bottom of the list but when you're re relying on that to safely get up and down the roadway um especially when you're only like two feet away from the concrete barrier that's running down the center of the road. That, in my mind, that's pretty dangerous, okay? Uh, DC, hey Rick, how do you avoid getting sideswiped? I had a drunk driver clip my mirror. 
Uh, DC, consider yourself very lucky if it was just your mirror. Uh, and I've said this before because there is a defensive driving article, and I think I referenced it on my website about this gentleman uh, that got into a traffic crash because he was driving down the road and somebody pulled out in front of him or somebody pulled out in beside him and instead of doing the sideswipe crash, he swerved into oncoming traffic and got hit by a big jacked up 4x4 and of, of course the truck came over the front of the hood and crushed the dash down into his legs. So if you have a choice between head-on crash and a sideswipe crash, take the sideswipe crash every day of the week because most side, side swipe crashes only result in property damage. In other words, it's just the cars. It's not the vehicle occupants. Of the four types of crashes, head-on crashes, side swipe crashes, T-bone crashes, and rear end crashes, side swipe crashes are the least dangerous to vehicle occupants inside the vehicle. So if you have a choice between that crash and other types of crashes, make sure that you take <laughs> the vehicle or the sideswipe crash. Now, avoiding sideswipe crashes anytime that you're merging in, especially if you're turning left or right, don't merge in beside other vehicles. Merge in behind the, in the space behind them or the space in front of them. That way that will protect you, okay? But as far as the mirror, sorry to hear about your mirror. I know it sometimes happens, but that's what's gonna happen. Uh, Tim, road paint is still sprayed with glass beads for reflectivity. Municipal lines could be different. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure whether this, I, I still think this is part of the state, but uh, it's interesting that, like, as, like I was saying, Tim, I just don't think that this paint that they're using now, uh, when you have to repaint the, the roadways every year now, uh, they're just, like you said, it isn't durable. Uh, PJ, can't avoid something that's unpredictable, such as drunk drivers. You can only stay observant and hope your reaction time is fast enough to move out of the way. Uh, PJ, no, that's not really true. Uh, if you're hoping that you're going to react, you're too close to other traffic and other road users. If you manage space around your vehicle, remember, space buys you time. Time buys you options. Options prevent crashes. If you're, if you're hoping that you're going to react in response to another road user like a drunk driver on the roadway you are too close to other traffic on the roadway and you have to manage space more effectively to reduce your chances of being involved in a crash okay uh tyler would have my car on cruise control on the highway while my passengers would be holding the steering wheel so i could eat a burger uh don't tell me that tyler please don't tell me that we see that in the movies but we don't need to know that Karina, uh, when returning the wheel from a turning position, is it appropriate to let the steering wheel slide through your hands by loosening your grip slightly but keep in contact with the steering wheel? Karina, yes, that is perfectly acceptable to allow the steering wheel to come back as long as you have your palms in contact with the steering wheel. Do not let your hands without. And then once it comes back, and then you can just correct it a little bit and then you can carry on. And Corey will put up the video on controlling the steering wheel and that will definitely help you out. Uh, Noah, uh, I have my class, CDL class next month. Uh, Noah, are you bus, truck, or straight truck? Which one are you going for? Crystal, I am awesome. And yourself, my friend? Uh, Crystal, today I practiced driving with my dad. My dad said I was doing better each time I practiced driving on Sundays. I'm still practicing turning in a parking lot. That's awesome, Crystal. <coughs> Uh, Carl, which do you think is better to work for, City of Ottawa or City of Toronto, TTC? Uh, Carl, City of Ottawa, if you have an opportunity to go to Ottawa, I would definitely pick Ottawa because Ottawa is very much a busing city. I mean, I'm not saying that Toronto isn't a busing city, but uh, Ottawa is much more a busing city. So that would be my choice, but that's just my own personal thing. You kind of have to weigh... Uh, which city you want to live in, whether you want to live in Ottawa or whether you want to live in Toronto. If you want much more of a kind of a metropolitan big city, then Toronto's your city. Uh, if you want more kind of a city that you can live in, uh, skating on the canal, you are into canoeing, wilderness stuff. Uh, it's very easy to, to move out of Ottawa and get into those wilderness kinds of things and whatnot. But, you know, Ottawa is a great city. I love Ottawa too. 
but different kinds of feels to the two cities. So it depends on which one you want to live in for sure. Uh, Epic, my friend. Here's another thing you don't uh, want to do in everyday driving and the road test is passing another vehicle inside a light controlled intersection. Happened today with my father driving. Yeah, yeah. try not to pass people, try not to change lanes and intersections. Both are incredibly dangerous. And as we talked about in the presentation, 40% of crashes happen at intersections. And we're not just talking about conventional intersections. We're talking about roundabouts. We're talking about laneways that intersect with public highways and roadways and those types of things. Any, way, any place where two vehicles or two road users are crossing each other's path. Crosswalks are intersections. Pedestrians are intersecting. Bicycle lanes are intersections with other traffic. All of these things you have to think about when you're driving and your situational awareness. Where am I? What kind of roadways am I on? What kind of vehicles are around me? Bicycles, skaters, scooters, snowmobiles. I mean, we're in wintertime, lots of places uh, in northern Ontario, northern Minnesota, the Dakotas, those types of things all have snowmobiles and they're coming into town and running along the roadways and those types of things. So you have to be aware of that. And of course, you have the odd bicycle riding around on the snow and whatnot. So that is another challenge. Uh, Rena, do you speak any other languages besides English? Uh, Rena, no. Uh, bad English. <laughs> and and a very small amount of French, but uh, very small. I mean, if you wrote something in French and you sent it to me, I could probably, between Google Translate and the dictionary, I could probably translate it, but no, English is pretty much it. Uh, PJ, all of Rick's videos are very helpful. Practice, practice, practice. Yes, indeed. Uh, Rena, how's the weather? The weather is good here. It was beautiful today. I mean, it was 10 degrees and melting and sunny, and it was just really nice. Um... John, I'm thinking, Rick, if I'm the only uh, Filipino here in the channel. No, you're not, John. There are others as well. So uh, awesome. Uh, Tyler, your videos helped me to continue and improve my driving skills. That is great news. Thank you so much for letting us know. And thank you for being part of the Smart Driver community uh, here on Smart Drive Test. Awesome. And if you are going for a driver's test, uh, make sure that you check out Passion Driver's Test First Time Course Package over at the Smart Drive Test website. You can pick that up for about $37 US. It also includes the winter driving and defensive driving smart courses that will significantly reduce your chances in being involved in a crash. So Corey will put the link up for that as well. So definitely check that out over at the Smart Drive Test website. Abigail, so there you go. So John and Abigail are both from the Philippines. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Tim is off for dinner. Thank you so much, Tim, for your contribution and have a great dinner, my friend. Make sure you use oven mitts, okay? Don't burn your hand again. Ooh, just, you told me that story. I'm still cringing about you burning your hand. Uh, Bluffer, I pick up things when driving with others. A friend drives way too aggressively. At the split second, the light turns green. Start shifting as the light is turning from red. Uh, what to do? <laughs> uh, maybe not ride with your friend or say to your friend, listen, if you're going to drive like that, I'm not going to ride with you. You do have that choice. And just on that point... We talked about new drivers not having a great deal of experience with driving, drinking, dating, and you know distractions, cell phones, telematics, and cars, and those types of things. If you are at a party and you get in a vehicle with somebody that you don't know, you don't know how much they've had to drink and those types of things, uh, <clears throat> don't get in the vehicle with them. I mean, there was that horrible crash there about a year ago in the state of California where there were six, eight people in a in an SUV with the driver that was a new driver. One of the participants or one of the young people was in the back of the SUV and wasn't restrained, rolled the vehicle over on a corner and the, unfortunately the person died. So it's not worth it. I mean, figure out how to get a ride home, those types of things. Have the conversation with your friends, your parents, family about, you know, if I'm out drinking and I give you a call at three o'clock in the morning, are you going to yell at me and get really upset? Or are you just going to get in the car and put your jacket on and come and get me? And that is a reciprocal agreement that works between you and your parents, right? The same thing with your parents. If they're out and they've had a few drinks, they can give you a ring on the phone and say, hey, come and get me. You will go and get them. So it works both ways and it keeps us all safe, okay? And reduces the amount of drunk drivers on the road. And we've already had a conversation about this. So please do that. Please have that conversation with your parents because then when it happens, 
you know that when you call up your parents and you say, hey, I can trust that, yeah, okay, I'm on my way, <coughs> and you shoot them the address, right? Because it's not just drinking, it's also marijuana and other kinds of drugs, right? So don't be driving if you're inebriated, please don't. And please have, the, have that conversation with your friends and family that you will do that for them and they'll do that for you. Uh, bluffer also, but also this one of the only people who is willing to drive is my supervisor. Well, I have my L, so I have to make the right judgments on things, whether to listen or not. Okay. But you you always have a choice about what you can do with your driving and keeping yourself safe. Uh, Mallory says drinking and driving is just not worth it. And that is too true. Uh, Beadsy, what should you do if you find yourself in a large patch of black ice? Get your foot off the throttle, get your foot off the brake, steer the vehicle in the direction that you want to go. If a crash is imminent, try and aim for something soft, <laughs> a hedge, a small fence, not a rock, not a big tree, because trust me, rocks and trees don't move, okay? I had a black ice incident there a couple years ago. I was going down to my rental property on Vancouver Island, hit a black ice, and of course, fortunately, there weren't any of their cars on the roadway. The vehicle went around three times and then kind of backed into the snowbank, and I was fine, but it happens. <clears throat> uh, Wendy, apparently marijuana was passed here. Yes, and there are a number of states, Colorado, California, other places where marijuana is legal. Uh, we have it here in Canada. I kind of wish they didn't because now we have a pot store on every corner uh, in the city. I mean, how does, this, how does a city of 100,000 need 20 pot shops? I'm just like, do we smoke that much pot? Just a question. Just a question. Uh, DC, what was my first car? My first car was a 1971 GMC half ton with a straight six cylinder engine with a three on the tree manual transmission. There you go. You can Google that. What is a three in the tree? <laughs> Tino, uh, if any of you live where they spread salt on the roads, check your brake lines to make sure they are not rusted. I had a brake line explode on me. Uh, I have a little adrenaline rush, not in a good way. Uh, yeah, that'll definitely happen. <clears throat> so did your brakes actually fa fail, Tino? Because that's not the way the brakes are set up. Uh, Crystal, also tomorrow I will be speaking at my school board meeting that I graduated uh, in the year 2021. This is going to be my first public speaking. I will be speaking on behalf of my mom. Awesome. Congratulations, Crystal. Good luck with that. Uh, you know, and uh, if you get too nervous, just remember that, uh, you know, just imagine them all sitting in their underwear. <laughs> that sometimes, that never, that never worked for me. I was always just like super nervous when I was young and doing public speaking. Uh, Michael, is it okay to stay behind the stop line when the green light is one second left and I want to turn left? My speed is low, so to be afraid to stop inside the crosswalk. Uh, no, Michael, if the light is green, you have to go. You can't stop on a green light. Okay, you have to go. You can't do that. I know what you're saying, but you can't do that. All right. So we're getting near the top of the hour here. Thank you so much for all your questions. Uh, one more epic here uh, regarding yellow lights. Once you pass the road test and light turns yellow, will you treat it like a road test red light or possibly go through assuring it is safe to do so? Uh, that's <clears throat> uh, epic. Again, it's a discretionary thing. It's like learning how to drive and treating the yellow, trying to figure out whether you're going to be able to safe to go through and whatnot. But um, most of the time you're gonna go through in a yellow unless you can get stopped. <laughs> uh, Tino, I had front brakes still, but lost the back brakes. But yes, but still you know that the brakes, there's something wrong with the brakes. You're going, oh my God, there's something wrong with the brakes. But yes, exactly what you just said is how the brakes are set up and designed, that they are designed with that fail safe in place. That if you lose a brake line on the back brakes and you lose the back brakes, you're still gonna have the front and vice versa. So they're not gonna fail completely. But we're happy to hear that you're okay, uh, despite your brakes failing on you. Uh, Wendy, could you give me your brief opinion on the difference between me driving a school bus going into a coach like Greyhound, but Academy? Uh, Wendy, you're going to have, I think you're going to have, it depends on what company you're working for, but I think you're going to have more steady employment as a coach driver as opposed to a school bus. Because remember, school bus drivers only work in the morning for a few hours couple two three hours and then in the afternoon again so it's kind of a split shift and you're not going to work for very long so it depends on what the kind of work you're looking for and what you want to do okay 
Uh, Richie, doing my class five driver's test in a couple of weeks, just watching your videos to prepare for it. You're gonna do fine, Ty. And if you have any questions, leave us a comment down in the comment section there as well. Hit that thumbs up button if you like what you see here and be sure to subscribe to the channel. Uh, Crystal, yeah, my mother is fighting her school so that she does not lose her job uh, due to the mandates. Yeah, all the best with that, Crystal. All right, so we're gonna leave it there for tonight. Thank you so much for joining. All the best uh, for those coming up to the driver's test here in the next week or so. Uh, if you passed your driver's test in the last couple of weeks, congratulations. All the very best with your new driving career and awesome, awesome, awesome. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.